Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution of the United States. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this program. Here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Welcome to another version of our Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. I am Bill O'Brien, and it is a pleasure to be with you on this gorgeous summer day on the 28th of May. I trust that everybody had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I know I did. I was uh, uh, blessed, and I, I say that uh, advisedly. My brother and sister-in-law drove down from New England and got here Friday evening and spent the entire weekend here and just, uh, just left uh, here from southern West Virginia this morning. And they're on their way back uh, north and uh, planning to stay in uh, Amish country in Pennsylvania for a few days before they arrive back home in uh, Massachusetts uh, at the end of the week. So uh, had a wonderful time with them, ate too much. Uh, when, when I was younger, I used to say ate and drank too much, but I don't drink too much anymore. Uh, it's mostly eating, and uh, the two don't go together. If I, uh, if I don't eat, I can drink, but uh, if, I, if I'm eating, I, uh, the food seems to take precedence all the time. But anyway, had a wonderful weekend, and I hope you did as well. I did miss our time together yesterday on, on Memorial Day, on Monday, uh, but uh, it seemed to me that uh, it was much more important that people enjoy uh, those they, they're closest to and love the most on, on a holiday weekend, especially a beautiful one in the early, in the early summer. And uh, uh, I was enjoying my weekend, and I trust that you were enjoying yours as well. But uh, it's back to business, and uh, I mean that, uh, uh, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek because this isn't business at all. This is, uh, this is enjoyable, but in effect it is. It is business, and uh, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, give you the, the basics here, uh, invite you to uh, give us a call and share with us some of your ideas and some of your perspectives. And uh, today's program uh, I'm envisioning is going to be a little bit uh, – uh, hit and miss, and what I mean by that is uh, I have a number of issues, three or four different issues that are, are kind of juggling all of them uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, most of it is, uh, is connected directly to emails that I received at the end of last week or over the weekend, uh, and I had made a commitment that if people took the time to, to email me rela on issues related to our program here, our time together, uh, I would make every effort to respond to them uh, if they seemed uh, uh, germane and, and, and relevant to the program and, and the, raise the kind of issues that I think all of our, all of our listeners, all of our participants would, uh, would be interested in and ought to know. And uh, there, are, there are several of those, three or four of those, to be honest with you, and, and I want to get to those. But before I do that, I want to uh, invite you to give us a call and... Uh, uh, share with us your ideas and your perspectives, your opinions uh, on some of the issues that we're talking about, have talked about, or most likely will talk about. Uh, this is a program on the Constitution of the United States in the broadest sense. And what I mean by that is we are looking not only at the actual structure of and content of the Constitution of the United States, but more important, its application or the application of those principles and those concepts as they affect our day-to-day -day lives, not only uh, uh, in the 18th century when the Constitution was drafted, but uh, in, into the 21st century when many of us find ourselves uh, still uh, living with uh, some of the principles and some of the ideals and some of the vision uh, that was uh, foreseen by our founding fathers a lot of it, ideas and issues that were not foreseen by our founding fathers, as we can, uh, I think we can readily understand that and realize that. Our phone number, uh, and I invite you to, to give us a call, uh, area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. My email address, uh, if you'd like to email me directly on today's program or an, an issue from a previous program, by all means, feel free to do that. 
My email address is waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, 906, all one word, at gmail.com. Uh, in our last uh, program together, if you recall, uh, we were uh, dealing with Charles Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution, um, and uh, we talked about uh, some of the recent scholarship dealing with Beard. Uh, we kind of uh, went a little bit. We didn't go into a lot of detail, but we looked a little bit at the scholarship as historians have wrestled with uh, Beard's economic interpretation. Uh, those that uh, have expanded upon it and and have found it um, meaningful for them, as well as those who did everything that they could possibly do to try to find ways to refute Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution. And the issue that uh, we concluded with, um, and, and the point that I would like to make, is that uh, some of the most recent scholarship is indicating, uh, once again, that Beard was not uh, totally off base by any stretch. He may not have had access to the kinds of resources uh, that historians enjoy access to today. Uh, we have a lot more resources, a lot more letters uh, and primary source materials from this period available today. And we can go into a lot more detail on some of the people that Beard study uh, with much more information uh, available to us. But the fact of the matter is, in, in some cases, the specific information currently available has, has contradicted some of Beard's um, educated guesses, I could say, because he was operating from much less substantive information than we have today. But the fact of the matter is, while people have found specific issues and sp specific circumstances under which M Beard have met, might have been over, uh, perhaps overstating the case or uh, uh, underestimating contradictions to his, to his thesis or whatever, the fact of the matter is nobody has successfully been able to put aside uh, his... Uh, overall view of the Constitution. And basically, I think if we look at it from a very general, broad perspective, I think we can understand why. It seemed, I believe I mentioned this in our last program, but if I didn't, uh, uh, let, me, let me say it now. It seems to me that anybody who would believe, even for a second, that people operate or people behave exclusively according to principle without any consideration at all of their own personal priorities or preferences would uh, most of us would agree would be rather naive uh, I think there's absolutely no question that there are very very few few people in the world who can put aside their own self-interest to the point that when they act they not, on, they, they not only don't act in, you know, in conformity with or, or with their own self-interest clearly in mind, but in effect they act in, a way, in ways contradictory to their own self-interest. Uh, we, like we would like to believe that there are public officials or public servants who would be willing to do that, but the fact of the matter is most of us have concluded that those are few and far between. Fact of the matter is, it would be rather naive to assume that the founders drafted the Constitution without any consideration at all to the impact that it would have on the economic well-being and the economic future of the country in general or the citizens in it, including them. There's absolutely no question, and I think if you look at Madison's vices of the political system, uh, which he put together in early in 1787 before the Constitutional Convention convened in May, you can begin to get an idea that many of Madison's priorities as far as weaknesses and problems 
related to the Articles of Confederation, related to the economic sphere particularly, and so it's very obvious that Madison's whole approach toward the Constitutional Convention um, was to address, find ways to address positively some of the failings that he believed he saw in the structure and behavior of state legislatures under the Articles of Confederation. Many of these were economically, were economic issues. They related to the payment of taxes. They related to property ownership. They re related to private debt and public responsibilities. And Madison saw all of these as, as being at issue and all of these as being considerations that needed to be repaired with the kind of change that the Constitution of the United States brought to the, to the nation in seven, after it was drafted in 1787. So, again, we know going in that these very same economic issues that Beard focuses on were priorities to James Madison and some of the key figures in the Constitutional Convention uh, from the get-go. And so it would be highly, uh, uh, it would be beyond the realm of reason to conclude that the Constitution of the United States was put together with only ideology in mind and economic issues uh, not being serious considerations. All the evidence suggests just the contrary. And so... Uh, in a, in, a, in a sense, I think one of the things we need to appreciate, however, and this is very, very significant, is that the whole idea of property, as it was unfolding in the late 18th century, was undergoing a substantial change and substantial redefinition. Madison made reference to this in Federalist Number 10 in his Vices of the Political System, in Federalist Number 51, I'm focusing specifically on those documents that we've taken time to look at here in our time together in, at, the, at the virtual center. Um, the, point, the point I'm making is that it's very obvious that the nature of property was changing. And whereas property, through, the, through much of the colonial period, and even before that, Property involves landed estates. It was based principally on land. And those who claim positions of influence and power in, in society were directly linked to the ownership of property. The idea being that one's ownership of land, the family estate, if you will, the plantation, the manor, you know, the estate, whatever, in whatever context it was, was not only land, it was also the basis of one's position and status in society. As such, it was not conceived by most people as being a commodity, as carrying a dollar, a dollar value. It was not something that people thought about turning over or selling for a profit. Because to do that would, would deny the individual involved the status and security that one needed to be held in high esteem by his peers in the society in which he lived. So the point I'm making is that property at, you know, as as land, as an as a landed estate, was the basis of aristocratic power during in colonial America and in Europe prior to the the colonial period. And consequently, property was not something that people readily look for opportunities to turn over or to sell or to break up or anything else, because to do so jeopardized your position, and your political status in society. By the time we get beyond the revolution, by the time we get into the 18th century, however, this whole idea of property is beginning to change tremendously. 
and more and more property is being viewed as a commodity. And as such, its meaning has expand, is expanding incredibly. Property, capital, involves much more than just land. It involves investments. It involves securities. It involves stocks and bonds. It involves financial assets. It involves companies. It involves commercial ventures. It involves insurance. It involves banking. And it involves land, but principally land speculation. Speculation in land where you buy land with the idea that you are going to turn it over and resell it at a profit. The, the similar example of that in today's society would be those people who buy real estate, and, and I'm using the expression that is often used, and flip it. Buy, buy a piece of real estate or a home, an old home, a fixer-upper, with the idea that they'll throw some paint on it and flip it, turn it over and resell it at a profit. And the point I'm making is that by the 18th century, this expanded idea of property had become commonplace. And the old idea of land being only the landed estate in the position of one's status was more the, was more the exception than the rule. The whole idea of commerce, of, of property, was changing. Property was clearly a commodity. It, it carried a price tag. It had a value. And one's worth in society was determined by one's ability to turn over property at a profit or to invest in land speculation and resale or whatever. And if you look at the changing nature of property as it existed in the late 18th century, I would suggest to you that's the kind of property that Charles Beard had in mind when he talked about personality as opposed to the term realty. Realty was based principally on real estate, on land. But personality was the kind of property that persons owned that indicated value and investment in an emerging capitalist society. And to assume that the framers of the Constitution drafted the document without serious consideration to issues like this would be foolhardy. It would be, at minimum, naive. It would be foolish. And indeed, given the long-range hopes and plans of the founders and the efforts that they saw in drafting the Constitution in establishing the kind of stability and the kind of security and the kind of long-term predictability which would, which would minimize risk and encourage investment, those are the kinds of principles that drove the framers of the Constitution to incorporate into the document the kinds of content that they put in there. The, the emphasis that we've had in previous programs on the Marshall Court, the emphasis on the Contract Clause, on the Commerce Clause, and all of these things, all of these speak to an emerging definition of capitalism which has moved substantially from the traditional landed state real estate idea of property. That's what Beard is taking into consideration when he talks about the consideration of the framers. Now, again, in the process, Beard makes suggestions and statements that suggest that many of the framers themselves were directly invested in these kinds of things. Naturally, as prominent people elected to represent their own states at the Constitutional Convention, many of the delegates there would have a personal vested interest 
in these kinds of issues, in these kinds of considerations. I don't think anybody in their right mind would expect anything different than that. So it seems to me a little bit unrealistic for critics of Beard to try to suggest to the public at large that the framers didn't have personal interests at all, that their interests were principally ideological, principally noble, that they were public ser ser servants, that they were, as Jefferson uh, referred to them from France during the period of the convention itself, they were an assembly of demigods. The assumption that these people were somehow beyond being human and therefore above many of these very mundane, practical, uh, economic considerations is a little bit naive and a little bit unfair, very honestly, to the founders, I believe. So basically, and I'm, I'm going to a book that I mentioned earlier here by Alan Gibson. It's called the Interpreting the Founding, Guide to the Enduring Debates over the Origins and Founding of the, of the American Republic. Um, Alan Gibson... Uh, summarizes Beard in the following way, and this is his effort to try to put together in manageable language the kinds of considerations that Charles Beard had. So let me just, if I can, read a paragraph from Alan Gibson's book, and I think it kind of puts all of this in context, and it kind of gives us something we can wrap our arms around and understand, and then we can move on to, to a couple of, of, of other issues. The Constitution, Charles Beard declared, in words that resonate throughout the history of the modern study of the Constitution, was an economic and anti-democratic document proposed and ratified by holders of personality, including merchants, moneylenders, security holders, manufacturers, shippers, capitalists, and financiers and their professional associates. So that's a pretty wide range of people who, to one extent or another, would be invested in capitalist considerations, we would call it. And these people, according to Beard, um, uh, were the, these holders of personality were the ones who proposed and ratified the Constitution, and, according to Beard, they were opposed by holders of realty, including non-slaveholding farmers and debtors, small farmers, debtors, the you know the so-called people who lived in the West, in rural areas. Those who were not directly involved as deeply in capitalist considerations. If they were farmers, they were obviously businessmen because the old idea of Little House on the Prairie where everybody grew their own food and was totally self-sufficient and independent, that's, that's a little bit unrealistic as well. What you find if you look at the, at the Confederation, at the, uh, uh, at the period of the Constitution in the 18th century, is that many people logically located near rivers, most of the major commercial centers in the 18th century were located on rivers for obvious reasons because access to rivers gave producers, farmers, the opportunity to move crops to market easily. Not only that, but many of these commercial centers on key rivers became transportation points, focal points where farmers would come in uh, farmers would get their produce to market, and then the pro the 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 products themselves, the pr the 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 crops that farmers would raise, would change hands and then be put on barges and ships for transportation down rivers. So, according to Beard, the major issues involved in the Constitution focus principally around personality rather than around realty. So when the framers talked about protections of property and the role of government protecting property, they were much more concerned about the rules and regulations governing the value of money, 
the sanctity of contracts, the regulation of trade, both within a state or a colony and with and between states and colonies, as well as commercial considerations with trade overseas with other countries. More specifically, this is out, I'm back to Alan Gibson again. More specifically, according to Beard, the Constitution could justly be said to be an economic and anti-democratic document for three principal reasons. One, the positive powers of the Constitution, including the powers to lay and, correct and collect taxes, to regulate interstate and foreign commerce, to raise and support naval forces, and to depose of Western lands, were designed to represent or benefit the interests of capitalists. So, again, this is one of the reasons why Beard characterizes the Constitution as an economic document that is principally anti-democratic. First, because the positive powers in the Constitution, including the powers to lay and collect taxes, regulate commerce, raise and support naval forces, and dispose of Western lands, were designed principally to benefit the interests of capitalists, of investors, of land speculators, of commercial interests, of manufacturers, of shippers, of bankers, of financiers, of investors, etc. Secondly, the reason that Beard termed the, the Constitution an economic document, the system of checks and balances in the Constitution was designed, according to Beard, to break up the attacking forces of popular majorities at the starting point and thus ensure that capitalists could secure legislation advantageous to their own interests. It's very obvious that Beard is onto something here. Because Madison talked about this. Madison talked about the extent to which state legislatures under the Confederation were inclined to intervene, to intercede in the interests of farmers and the interests of majorities, of the poor, and to pass legislation directly affecting debt, taxes, installment payments for debts, uh, temporary postponements in the payments of debts, all of these contract issues which detrimentally affected investors, creditors. So according to Beard, a reason for calling the Constitution an economic document was because the system of checks and balances built into the Constitution was principally designed to break up the forces, the popular majorities that heretofore under the Confederation had been able to interfere with the investment interests and priorities of capitalists. And third, the Constitution explicitly forbade state legislatures from emitting paper money or passing laws impairing the obligations of contract. When you look at the specific elements within the Constitution, the states no longer had the power to create paper money, to, to emit paper money. That means they no longer had the power to inflate the value of currency, to make money more available in order to make it easier for the debtors to get their hands on, cap, on, on money, on bills of credit. And so by government coming down and sanctifying the validity of contracts, and of course that's what Marshall's doing in these Supreme Court decisions in Dartmouth College versus Woodward as well as McCulloch versus Maryland, is adhering to the idea of contract, to the sanctity of contracts. And what he is saying is that governments, state governments can no longer violate the sanctity or the integrity of private contracts and no longer can government undertake programs and policies that affect the value of money, that inflate currency to such a degree that you affect 
the standard of living within the society which you govern as government. In other words, the priorities of capitalists are driving the content of the document, according to Charles Beard. And for those three reasons, Beard concludes that the Constitution of the United State is, States is an anti-democratic economic document, first and foremost, because it was designed to prevent the kinds of activities or to ensure the kinds of activities which would create the kind of economic environment in the nation which would be most conducive, conducive to capitalists, to investors. It would minimize risk and expand opportunity. And that's really what Beard believed the Constitution of the United States was all about. And the fact of the matter is, as hard as critics have tried, it's been impossible to totally deny or to refute. Excuse me, they denied it but they ne never were able to refute those conclusions that Beard has made. Because the fact of the matter is, if they were successful in refuting that, then what that would mean would be that the framers who put the Constitution together did it without consideration of these issues. And if the framers had done that, that would be, that would be an impeachable offense to put together a frame of government and put in it the kinds of policies and principles that did not solidify the economic future of the country. So the fact of the matter is, it's really naive. The problem is, uh, I know William Howard Taft, at the time that Beard wrote in 1913, was one of the most outspoken critics of the Beard thesis. And what, what, what Taft and others found most appalling about Beard was the fact that Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution tended to defame the founders. It tended to portray the founders as businessmen, as self-interested investors and businessmen, more than as, as demigods, as public servants, who were trying to do as best as they as best they could the public's business and so it was in order to try to protect this rather illusory idea of the founders as being a little bit above being human that Taft and others found most offensive I would suggest to you that there's really nothing wrong with with this that this is very, very understandable. It's very, very logical. And I think the people that, that try to deny Beard and try to deny these realities of the Constitution, they are the ones who, uh, you know, who are really guilty of, of committing some sort of violation of credibility. No wonder people's understanding and appreciation of history is so conflicted in this country. What you know when you when you think about this, because oftentimes, what we want history to demonstrate to us takes precedence over what history teaches us. One of the you know one of the real issues in our in our history, it seems to me, is the extent to which we have gone overboard in order to try to make history say what we wanted it to say rather than dealing with what it did say and the fact of the matter is I believe I believe that our youngsters are sharp enough to realize this they see the hypocrisy and the contradictions here and for purposes of success in the classroom or getting good grades or whatever they'll play along but the fact of the matter is they don't believe it for a second and neither neither should we so again i believe that uh 
that this is uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly important issue. And, and we'll be back to it, absolutely no question. I mentioned that, that we had a, a number of emails uh, from, from listeners, um, and I wanted to, uh, to share a few of those with you. And uh, I'm not going to get into the personalities. Uh, one person who sent me an email uh, gave me permi permission to use his name or, or whatever, and he said, you know, I'm not going to put anything in any of my emails that would, you know, that would, that would create a, a problem for me or for anybody else. But I, you know, I, my, my sense is that if the person wanted to be on the air, they could, pick, they could use the phone and call us. The, the, again, the number, 304-658-3333. And if they choose to send an email for whatever reason, it probably means that, you know, that they're reluctant for some reason or other to, to call in and be on the air. Maybe, and, and I know this is true in, in, a, in several cases, maybe because people are picking up this cro these programs that are being archived and they're not responding to, to, to what we're talking about at the time we're on live. And so because it's late, they feel much more comfortable um, uh, addressing it in an email rather than, rather than calling in on it. And I understand that because since we are in the Internet, time zones change and, and, and are different. And uh, somebody made the point that when we're on live, it's 4 a.m. where he is. Uh, and so the chances are pretty remote that we're going to get a call uh, from this person during, uh, during our, our live broadcast. But one of the one of the issues, and I'm, I'm taking I'm not taking these in any order, um, but I wanted to share with you because I think I think the quality of these email, these emails is incredible, and and I I want to pay homage to the to the people who took the time to write them. This one deals um, with education, and of course you know that we've done a number of our programs in the past on education, and the reason I'm mentioning this first is because it seems that we just touched on that and it seems to be consistent with what we just touched on when we talking when we talked about um, uh, people trying to make history say what they want it to say rather than rather than dealing with what it does say um, and and in a sense what we're talking about here is interpreting the past in such a way that the spin associated with how we portray the past becomes much more important than than the accuracy of that portrayal. And this particular email deals with the issue of education generally, more specifically with the issue of anti-intellectualism. And we have talked about this, I remember we talked about this several weeks ago, we were talking about Jefferson's ideas uh, on education. And the question that is being asked here is, how has anti-intellectualism related to the two views of education um, as a way to make better citizens of the elite and education as vocational training for the masses. And basically what this, what this email is suggesting here is that it almost seems that we're operating uh, uh, you know, on two different definitions of, of, of education here. We're talking about educating the elite to make the decisions and understand the policies and procedures for governing a nation. And then we're talking about the kind of education that focused principally on getting a job. And as part of this email, the, the person who sent it included a number of links to specific articles related to various aspects of this. So let me just touch on uh, what the email says uh, in, within this context of anti-intellectualism and education. The, the, I'm, I'm quoting from the email. The current manifestation of anti-intellectualism has been disturbing me for some time, this person says. One unsettling example is directed primarily at the vocational purposes of education and demeans any other purpose of education as childish. Quote, sure, when you were a kid, everything is not about careers. But when you grow up, everything is about earning enough money for food and shelter. So you need to figure out how to do that in order to make the transition from childhood to adulthood. And this is, the, this is from one of the links that the email is sent. The rest of the article, the, the, this person says, is equally disturbing. And so basically the, the issue being raised here 
is the issue of whether education primarily ought to focus on getting a job because we all have to have a job or whether education ought to be for the knowledge involved and and again this is a very very complicated issue um, I think you could we could spend you know at least one full program just on the, on this particular issue at least that there's absolutely no question that all of us need to get a job uh, there's no question however one of the realities of this is that if we focus if we if we manipulate education if we turn education around in such a way to focus on careers then i would suggest to you in light of the kinds of skills that that we need today in order to remain competitive we would be we're doing a disservice to our students i would ask you to think about the extent to which these two apparently contradictory views of education education for the elite in other words education for for purposes of knowledge and education for careers are not necessarily exclusive because we have reached the point in the world today where the kinds of skills that a high quality education requires are the very same skills that one needs to master in order to be successful in the pursuit of careers in demand today the skills of creativity the skills of critical thinking the skills of doing research of ranking information of prioritizing issues of of putting together hype you know uh uh, a, hypo a hypothesis, a prospective answer to a question, and then testing it out by doing further research. The very same skills that employers of the highest paid professions are demanding today are the skills of a high quality, intellectual, cognitively challenging education. No longer are we educating people to work on assembly lines in factories. Those people whose education doesn't go beyond that level are not securing jobs at all in today's world. So in a sense, we may be missing the boat by looking at these two approaches to education as being contradictory to each other or exclusive. They may both be, you know, be in a sense linked let me get on to the next paragraph in this email there's also a contradiction within the vocational view of education college degrees are incre increasingly being required to secure even non-intellectual jobs at the same time rates of underemployment tend to increase with increasing educational achievement and this apparently the link on this is a program that appeared recently on national public radio on NPR in response, the elite advise employers to discredit the vocational value of education. Employees with college degrees are damaged goods. Whatever's going on with these kids at these schools, it's not education. Hiring them is fiscally irresponsible, if not dangerous. I think what's going on in my home industry of higher education at present is something between a bubble and a scandal. And so what we have here is a totally different issue. And that is the idea that many of our people who are going to college are being underemployed. They're getting jobs that don't begin to challenge the, the skill levels that they come out of college with, that they bring to the, to the marketplace. I would suggest to you that if you can if you give into that you have two it seems to me you've got two approaches here two possible options one is to educate people down to where the jobs are and the other thing is to educate people at a level with the idea that the jobs will come up to meet those to meet those skill levels 
I think one is entirely preferable to the other from my own from my own perspective let me suggest something else that's a little bit political but I think it's worth thinking about and, and uh, let me preface this by saying that since I personally am am located in in West Virginia, this is an issue that's that's very very prevalent in, within the state of West Virginia as well as other economically troubled and educationally underperforming states. There's kind of a pervasive sense within education within West Virginia, and it's been here for a long time, that suggests that many parents don't want their children educated because if they get a lot of education, they'll be more likely to leave in order to pursue a job that begins to approach the talent levels, the skill levels that they've reached. In other words, if you over-educate your, your young people for the jobs that exist, then the only way these people can be fulfilled is to leave. And so consequently, many people in this region believe parents really don't want their children well-educated because if you keep them not well-educated, they're most likely to remain here and stay at home and be satisfied with less challenging jobs which would, which would not take them away, take them out of the state. The other side of that perspective is the idea that if you have an economy that is underperforming, in other words, if challenging jobs are not being created fast enough to meet the educational levels of the people coming out of your public schools and out of your colleges, then what you're going to end up with is a very over-educated population, underemployed and over-educated. And politically, from the perspective of some people, that's a very dangerous political situation. You've got a lot of people who are not able to meet their potential but they have the ability to understand the economy well enough to know what they don't have. And if you have a large number of over-educated, underemployed people in any political constituency, you have the potentiality of a problem, of a political problem. There are many people who believe that the nation's emphasis today on community college education because community college education seems to focus on the jobs and the skills that are there for people. There are some people who believe that part of the emphasis on community college education is a way to try to discourage the brightest people from going to college and then being disappointed because the jobs that meet their capabilities will not be there. And rather than have highly intelligent people walking around with college degrees who can't find the kinds of career opportunities that they feel they are entitled to, the next step of that is some sort of political action. And many people believe that what we see nationally is an effort to divert some of our brightest people away from colleges and universities and graduate degrees and into community colleges which lead directly to the workplace. And that way you are eliminating the potentiality of a political problem down the road. Many people are afraid of a society that contains a lot of well-educated Un unemployed or underemployed people, professionals. That, to many people, is a very dangerous political situation. And so focusing on vocational education, focusing on career, you know, job-focused education, 
in the minds of many people, is a way to solve that problem. It's a way to get people jobs, but it's also a way to make sure that you don't have a lot of these people that are taking, that are pursuing education at a level which the career, the career opportunities are just not going to be there. I would suggest to you that that's a little bit frightening. Because it seems to me, in light of what's happening in the world, that we need highly skilled, highly educated, highly creative people. And to think that we would pursue, be pursue, pursuing a policy that was contradictory to that is frightening. But in fact, many people believe that that's what we're doing. So what we're seeing over and over and over again in newspapers, in journals, in magazines, online, in blogs, and various other places is more and more you know, emphasis on the idea that in today's world we don't need all of these four-year college degrees, we don't need all these master's degrees and all these PhDs, that all we're doing is, is turning out a lot of people that are going to end up, end up unemployed or underemployed and very disenchanted, and, and, that, and that we don't want that. So many people are raising questions about, you know, is college overpriced? Are we paying too much? Is it worth it? Is it worth going into the kind of debt that students are graduating from colleges with today? Uh, you know, are we, you know, are we overeducating people? Are colleges selling the value of a college education just to keep their enrollments up in order to keep faculty employed? And all of this raises serious questions, it seems to me, about the kind of society that we want to create in this country. To be very honest with you, it's kind of like one of these articles, one of the references uh, in this email was to a program on NPR, and National Public Radio. You can look at NPR itself and raise some serious issues. I personally tend to be a big supporter of public, public broadcasting, public television and public radio. Because I think the quality of broadcasting, to me, speaks to the kind of culture I want my young, our young people to grow up in. I don't want to take classical music and throw it out there in the marketplace and say, well, not enough people appreciate classical music. It, it, it won't go unless we subsidize it. Therefore, let's not take public money and subsidize it. Let's just let it disappear. It seems to me the issue is, is an appreciation of good music something that we want our young people to experience and enjoy? Is that part of what being a, an educated person in a vibrant culture, in a dynamic culture, is all about. If it is, then it seems to me we have a vested interest in making sure that it's available, whether, in fact, it attracts enough people. In other words, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, if you throw concert music out there, classical music out there, and force it to compete for supporters it's obviously not going to be successful. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're, you're de you know, it's predetermined that in a, in a marketplace of ideas, classical music, being one example, is going to lose. So the question is, is classical music important enough to the society we want that we need to keep it alive and that part of our effort of educating people is to create more people who appreciate the value of good music? Or do you just take a snapshot in time and say only 18% of the population at large appreciate classical music? We can't afford to do that anymore. Let's let it disappear. I would suggest to you that that's what many people want. In other words, what we're talking about here is do we look at education 
as a way to create the kind of society we would like our children to grow up in? Or do we look at education as a way to meet the current career demands of a culture and a society that intends or plans to go nowhere? And I would suggest to you, if you put the, if you put the, the choices that way, then it raises additional issues here. So in a sense, um, maybe a college degree is not overpriced at all. Maybe it is. But I, I appreciate the email, and I appreciate the issues that the emailer has raised because they are important ones. There is nothing in the Constitution that relates directly to the issue of education. However, states, I know the state of West Virginia does, the state of West Virginia has a constitutional obligation to educate all of its young people, all of its children. And other st many other states do the same thing. There's nothing in the Constitution for that, but I would suggest to you that the research on the framers of the Constitution suggest that these people, the Jeffersons and the John Adamses and the Benjamin Rushes and the Madisons and the Washingtons, these people saw the value of education and they saw it as being a critical ingredient of the kind of society that they wanted to create in this country. And I think all of us need to recognize that. John Adams, if you read his letters to his wife, Abigail, about the education of their son, John Quincy, it's very clear that both John and Abigail are very aware about the quality of education that John Quincy experiences. If John Quincy Adams is going to be a leader in this country, and that's what they clearly intend for him to be, then it's very important that he get the kind of education that people expect a leader to have. That he has the level of awareness, that he has a cosmopolitan background, that he has traveled, that he is familiar with other countries, he's familiar with foreign languages, he's familiar with philosophy and history and, po and politics and geography and rhetoric and science and all the rest of it. Because people expect their leaders to, to enc encompass a particular image of what an educated person ought to be. John Adams refers to this as liberal arts. That's what he sees the liberal arts. The liberal arts education is the way you create culture in those people that you want to be leaders and examples and mentors of your young people. Therefore, it's very important to educate them that way. When we talk about vocational education, we're talking about educating for what's there and not wasting the money educating for something that's not there. And the question is, if it's not there, is that the problem? Is it something that ought to be there? And if it is, then you've got to educate for it. And I would suggest to you, if you make educational policy in accord with a, with, a, with a series of snapshots in time and say, this is what the priorities of America are, this is what the skill demands of the American workplace are right now. Let's educate only for that and everything else we'll get rid of and we'll save the money. We'll make education a lot more efficient. But what potentially are we doing to the future of the country and to the next generation and the generation after that? And I would suggest to you, the founders were very, very aware of those issues. Many of the people who are in policy-making positions right now don't seem to be. And I would suggest to you that that's potentially a real problem. We're going to pause and take a, a break for three or four minutes here, and then we'll come back with our second hour. And I have another email that I'd like to share with you, and this relates something that, to something that is in the Constitution of the United States, and that is the issue of treason. 
But first, let's take three or four minutes and take time to stretch, uh, stretch and catch our breath, and we'll come right back to the virtual center on the study of the Constitution. I'm Bill O'Brien. Be right back. Thank you, and welcome back. If you are just joining us uh, for our second hour, we welcome you to today uh, with the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. If you've been with us uh, since the start of our program today, we thank you so much for staying with us. And as I've mentioned several times, uh, I, I appreciate that. I realize that, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's much easier to leave sometimes than it is to, to stay around. So I'm hoping... Uh, that the material, the content, uh, you find uh, worthy enough and stimulating enough uh, to be worthy of your time, very honestly. And if you stay with us, I appreciate that very much, and I want you to, to know that. Our phone number, uh, area code 304-658-3333. Again, area code 304-658-3333. My email address, waobrian906 at gmail.com. WAOBrian906 at gmail.com. Um, as mentioned just before we took our break at the top of the hour, I'd like to respond to another email uh, that I received, and this one focuses on the issue of treason. And uh, let, me, uh, let me present to you the issue uh, as the email presented it. Uh, and then I will take you know, a, a moment or two to to offer uh, some thinking on it myself. And I I, I taught a class this morning uh, here in Southern West Virginia, and I I introduced the same issue to my to my class, and I asked for their perspective and their insights on on the the questions being raised in this email. I ask you the same. If you would obviously. It, it is soliciting your input. So if you do choose to call, then by all means, this will be a perfectly appropriate time to do so. Uh, again, the number, 304-658-3333. Let's, let's get into the email uh, as quickly as we can. It's a, it's a little bit extensive, but, but I think it's very clear and it's very, very, very well thought out. And I think it's something that all of us would be well to spend a few moments at least thinking about. So after some contra introductory words about the, the center and our programs and about the issue of, of call-ins and conversation and all the rest of it, the, the email, who's Rick, uh, Rick gets directly into uh, the issue at hand. And he said, so with that said, the question on my mind today has to do with the word that's been occurring with increasing frequency in our political discourse, treason. It's nothing new to see accusations of every crime under the sun leveled at our leaders from the extremes of our politically active populace. But a new wrinkle has come up that I think is worth some consideration. The notion that the unprecedented obstruction of government processes from the political right constitutes a form of, of treason. Let me share that again because I didn't read that as quickly. What he is raising is the notion that the unprecedented obstruction of government that we are currently seeing in Washington from the political right constitutes in his mind, or does it, a form of treason. Most discussions of this nature are quickly put to bed, as treason is, is very specifically laid out in the Constitution. Quote, treason against the United States shall consist only in level, leveling war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, unquote. It seems obvious that in these years, that in the years immediately following the revolution, the framers had a very clear idea of treason as something that occurs in time of war with a specific enemy. Certainly, the latter half of this definition only works under those circumstances. My question, though, is how broadly can we define levying war against one's own country? On the one hand, this looks like one of those areas where the framers thought they were being perfectly explicit and unambiguous in their language, as with the Second and the Fourth Amendment. 
while perhaps failing to take into account future developments and interpretations that would throw that language into doubt. So the other, in other words, the emailer is conceding that in the issue of leveling war against your country, this looks like something that the framers were very specific about when they addressed the issue of treason. What does it mean to levy war on a nation? The question is asked. Is it strictly limited to physical violence? What about undermining a nation's economy to the point of causing disease, starvation, and death among its population? What about deliberately sabotaging the country's credit rating, resulting again in widespread pain and injury among the people? The modern Republican Party has, to some degree, done these things to the people of the United States, deliberately and with the full knowledge that their actions endanger the citizenry, and they've done this for no other object than short-term political gain. Or from a different angle, when one nation goes to war with another and invades their territory, one of the key strategies is to bomb infrastructure in order to disrupt commerce and supply lines. Sort of a siege tactic writ large. When a bridge is bombed, for example, there will almost definitely be casualties. But what of our own situation in America, where we know that we have tens of thousands of bridges in a state of imminent collapse? Yet we can't get the necessary funding to get them repaired, again, for any number of ulterior motives from the Republican opposition, whether it be the desire to force sale of public commons to private companies or simply to make the president look weak and incapable of governing. When a bridge is bombed, people generally die. When a bridge collapses due to calculated negligence, the same thing happens. Yet we tend to place only the former example in the category of acts of war. I wonder, is that right? Is that in accordance with the spirit of our nation's founding? To be clear, I have no real doubt that the founders conceived of warfare as anything other than the traditional sort involving bombs, guns, and the rest of it. And certainly they understood the dangers of political factions just as certainly the various branches of government were designed to encourage a certain amount of obstruction. But that said, I also have great difficulty believing they would have been anything short of astonished and disgusted at the shameless partisanship from the right wing that has our government all but paralyzed, incapable of seeing to the needs of vast segments of our citizenry whose well-being and indeed very lives depend on a basic level of functionality which is being deprived callously and deliberately by the people elected to fulfill that need. Setting aside legal questions such, a bur such as the burden of proof necessary to prosecute someone in a court of law, what ultimately is treason? What do we know of the founders that could tell us what they, could, what they would make of this current situation? If deliberate, potentially deadly obstruction doesn't rise to the level of treason as such, then what would they have called it? Dereliction? Conspiracy? Because remember, we're not talking about the actions of a handful of bad actors or misguided, irresponsible individuals. Elected officials are caught committing all kinds of criminal acts all the time. We're talking about a coordinated effort to prevent government's functions government function across the board to the extent possible. Surely the founders would not view this behavior as acceptable, normal, or healthy functioning of government. At its most basic expression, how do we answer this question? What do we call it when a major political party or other faction acts deliberately to harm the general welfare of the nation? If that isn't treason, if it isn't an act of warfare upon one's home country, what is it? There has to be an appropriate legal term for it. That's my question for the week. I look forward to reading or hearing your thoughts on the matter.
and then he goes on to basically give me permission to use his name or identify him as much as possible. And he said, if I want to refer to him as Rick, which is his name, that's fine. If I want to refer to him as Horst, which is the name that a lot of people on the horn knows him by, that's, that's fine as well. So let's address this. Let's take on this issue for, for a few moments and, and think about Let's think out loud if we can. I introduced this question in a class this morning to a dozen senior citizens. I teach, as I mentioned before, I, on Tuesdays I teach a senior citizen class in the morning. And the, today was the last class. We, we've, we're suspending activities for the summer. We pick up in the fall after Labor Day again. I've been teaching this class for about 17 years now, every Tuesday morning. And to tell you the truth, I find that I get more out of it than they do. But, but we won't we won't go into that right now. Um, one of the things that I had to acknowledge this morning is that when I be began this endeavor, I was teaching a class to senior citizens. Over the 17 or 18 years that I've been doing it, I've become one of them. And, and uh, I, I've, I'm, deal I'm trying to deal with that. But I threw out this issue today. I didn't read the whole email to them, but I, I basically laid out the scenario about treason, and about war against one country, one's country, and what exactly does constitute war against one con one's country? Does a deliberate strategy designed to make government unable to govern constitute war against your own society, especially if people die as a result? Bridges collapse. Government's responsibility, according to the Constitution, to promote the general welfare is not possible if government cannot function. And so if you have a particular faction or a particular group or one of the parties whose number one priority is to make sure that government cannot govern, and the result of that is pain, loss of jobs, loss of life, denial of education benefit, denial of health care, or out-and-out out death from a collapsing bridge or building or whatever might happen because of a lack of attention to our infrastructure, does that constitute treason? The first question that one of the members of my class raised, and I would throw it out for your consideration, is even if it does, Who's going to enforce it? Follow-up discussion on that point raised the, the following consideration. Are we engaging in an intellectual exercise here in debating this issue? Because realistically, is it going to be possible to do anything about it, even if we conclude that something should be done about it? even if we conclude that this does constitute a form of treason. Given the way the Constitution defines treason, and given the fact that we're talking about a constituency, a faction within government itself, as being the perpetrator of this form of treason, are we likely blowing you know, are we just basically uh, making sounds? Are we just talking for the sake of talking? Are we wasting our time? Or is there value to this kind of an intellectual exercise? Another issue that was raised by one of the members of my class, and I think it's a consideration, is the um, Pandora's box that this kind of question opens. In other words, isn't it possible to interpret almost any failure on the part of government in this in the same way? In other words, if you define treason this way, what's to prevent us from the from seeing treasonable actions and a lot of other government failures 
in a lot of other ways. In other words, are we open a Pandora's, opening a Pandora's box here? Are we creating a situation where there's so much flexibility and the issue becomes so vague and so amorphous that the very word treason ceases to have any meaning anymore? And so that was a consideration. And then a third issue that was raised, which kind of relates to the first one, is what can we do about it? We're a dozen people sitting here on a Tuesday morning in southern West Virginia debating this particular issue as perhaps an, a an aspect of treason. So once we reach our decision, what have we got? What do we do with it? Who's going to listen to us? Are we wasting our time? Is it possible that we could do more damage to ourselves as a group by drawing a line in the sand on this issue which we have so little chance to be successful with, would we be doing damage to other issues which, we, which might come along in the future where we had a better chance to really affect the outcome, to really have an influence on what happens? Once we are identified with this issue, which goes nowhere, then people are not going to be inclined to listen to us the next time. And the next time, the issue that we're raising might be one that we could do something about. So in a sense, are we damaging our credibility by taking on this issue because it's so impossible to expect a positive outcome? I thought that was, that was a particularly interesting point of view. I'm wondering if you have an issue here. I'm not an attorney, but I would suggest to you that there's absolutely no question, and what, that's what we've been dealing with over the last couple of weeks, that certain aspects of the Constitution were intentionally left open to interpretation. That's the role that John Marshall is filling for the courts in the early 19th century. The Necessary and Proper Clause, the Supreme Law of the Land Clause, these are difficult portions of the Constitution to define accurately. They defy definition. They defy parameters. The elimination of the word expressly from the Tenth Amendment opens the interpretation of the Constitution to all sorts of possibilities that would not be there if the word expressly had remained in the Tenth Amendment. If the federal government only had the powers specifically given to it and everything else belonged to the states or the people of the state, states, except those powers expressly given to the central government, then there would be no room for interpretation by the Supreme Court at all. Constitutionality on most issues would be a slam dunk. So in a sense, by not including the word expressly, and you remember John Marshall in the McCulloch, I believe it's the McCulloch case, made the point that the framers intentionally left out the word expressly because of the problems that it was creating for government during the Confederation. And of course what he means is because it so limited the power of government 
or in the case of the Confederation period, it gave the states almost unlimited power in every area where power was not expressly delegated to the central government. The way that the Articles of Confederation was, was phrased with the use of the word expressly in the second article, what it meant was the central government had specific delegated powers. Everything else, even what's implied, belonged to the states. And it was that fact that caused the Constitution of the United States to come together in the first place. They caused the Constitutional Convention to convene. It was the need to deal with that reality. So it stands to reason then that certain elements of the Constitution would be open to interpretation so that power would remain flexible and that it would be more difficult to define and contain and to identify specific parameters of particular powers on the part of the federal government. I'm privy to an issue that came to my attention today. I wanted to share this with you. Bob Kincaid sent this to me in an email. Uh, he got it from a listener, um, uh, one of his regular listeners, John Roby. And it's about the going all the way back into the period of the of the Constitution. It's about the seizure of Indian lands, of Native American lands here in the United States, states specifically in New York State, the Six Nations or the Iroquois, as you remember. And basically, the article is about Native American communities from New York that are beginning once again to take up the fight for the environment on lands that they are claiming going all the way back to the colonial period are rightfully theirs. And in this article, there's specific mention here of the treaty that goes all the way back 400 years between the Native American Confederacy and European settlers. The treaty was originally consecrated according to what is called two-row wampum, a belt of purple and white beads still had held by the Onondagas in New York. The agreement committed the parties to friendship, peace, and sovereignty each row representing the parallel paths of Indians and settlers. It was to hold force, quote, as long as the grass is green, as long as the rivers flow downhill, and as long as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. In other words, forever. This land was given to the Native Americans forever. And successive governments, first the Netherlands, then England, and eventually the United States, renewed these basic principles. And the article points out that in the Constitution of the United States, Article 6, in the very famous Supreme Law of the Land Clause, enshrined this treaty by suggesting that this treaty was the supreme law of the land. And it's pointed out in this article that in the 1790s, Congress explicitly prohibited the seizure of lands without federal approval and Indian consent. So in other words, if somebody wanted to take this land, they needed approval of the federal government because, remember, Article 4 of the Constitution gives the Congress of the United States the right to regulate the territories and also the approval of the Indians who were given perpetual control of this land. But then it points out that over the years 
this treaty was disobeyed over and over and over again to the point, for example, that the Onondaga, the sovereignty assigned to the Onondaga, now amounts to only 9.3 square miles of land. In other words, so much of this land, so much of this treaty has been emasculated over the years. This is the point that I want to raise. In 1823, in the case of Johnson versus McIntosh, Chief Justice John Marshall justified the colonial seizures of these Indian lands under something called the Discovery Doctrine. The Discovery Doctrine referred back to the 15th century when the Pope, in the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, divided the world between Spain and Portugal with the so-called line of demarcation. Those of you who remember your history books, remember that. In order to avoid a war between Portugal and Spain over control of the New World, the Pope drew an artificial line called the line of demarcation and basically assigned control over lands to the west of that line to Spain and to the east of that line to Portugal. That was in 1494, two years after Columbus's first voyage. You will note, of course, that this had nothing to do with the colony, with the American colonies, because they didn't exist yet. In fact, this treaty had nothing to do with England, because England was not yet a player in the world of nations. The two dominant nations at this time were Spain and Portugal. Therefore, this doctrine of discovery only applied to them. It basically gave Christian explorers the right to claim lands that they discovered and to lay claims to those lands for the particular Christian monarch who they represented, whether it would be the king of Portugal or the king of Spain. Any land that was not inhabited by Christians was, according to this papal bull, I, I, I don't, I'm not being sarcastic there, it's called a papal bull. It's not papal bull in the generic sense. Any land that did not, that was not already inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited. In other words, if it was inhabited by anybody but Christians, it wasn't inhabited at all. If the pagan inhabitants could be converted, they might be spared. If not, they could be enslaved or killed. This was the discovery doctrine. In 1823, John Marshall, in the case of Johnson versus McIntosh, juridically included the discovery doctrine into American jurisprudence. This doctrine was Marshall's explanation of the way in which colonial powers could lay claim to newly discovered lands during the age of discovery. Under it, title to newly discovered lands lay with the government whose subjects discovered the territory. And so from then on, it became approved by the Supreme Court. It became legitimate to take territory that was owned by anybody but Christians. 
I suggest to you that the whole issue of the sanctity of property, the property rights, which is getting so much attention by the Marshall Court during this very same period, only applies to Christians, not to Native Americans. And so this article that, that Bob forwarded to me is about a movement to try to change that. There's a big demonstration that's going to happen in August, the 9th of August. There's going to be several hundred canoes that are going to sail down the uh, uh, Hudson River and arrive here in 98. Uh, this issue of protecting the lands that theoretically Indians thought were protected hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The point that I want, and the reason Bob sent it to me, obviously, was because of the mention of John Marshall and the doctrine of discovery that is included here and is made part of a legal principle, legal justification for the right to take territory away from people who are not Christians. Think about that. And by indoctrinating and including it, integrating it, in the case of Johnson versus McIntosh in 1823, John Marshall is giving it legal credibility within American jurisprudence. That's the kind of interpretive power that the Marshall Court is exercising during this formative period once the Constitution is ratified and goes into effect with the election of Washington and the first Congress in 1789. And along comes John Marshall right after the turn of the millennium in 1801 and Marshall as Chief Justice begins to use these vague amorphous phrases within the Constitution in order to enhance the power of the federal government and to promote the economic vitality and the economic growth of the nation at large. What is my point here? My point is that this is a classic example of how the courts have seen fit over the years to basically find legal precedent in order to justify what particular political and economic situations seem to require at that particular moment. The nation required the availability of Western land. As settlers were coming into this country for the availability of land and land ownership, the American dream was being defined, and citizens from all over the world came here in order to experience the American dream. And part of making that American dream a reality lay with the role of the Supreme Court in the way it interpreted the powers of government to make the, the American dream available to citizens and new citizens, you know, uh, to immigrants coming into, coming, into this, coming into this nation. It is, it seems to me, incredibly questionable since Marshall can't even go back to British common law to justify this doctrine of discovery because when the papal bull was first issued in the 15th century it didn't even include England let alone the American colonies or the United States of America so I think what we're seeing here is evidence of how broad and how expansive the interpretation of the Constitution in particular places can be. Therefore, Rick's question about treason, while it seems to be going a little bit beyond the, beyond the edge, so to speak, isn't nearly as far out as Marshall's 1823 decision on the doctrine of discovery in order to justify the seizure of lands. 
but let's even be let's raise a couple of other political issues here and consider even more political substance to this issue what if Marshall's concern was not so much for the citizens who would come in here and need the availability of land in order to make the American dream a reality. What if Marshall's primary concern were the land speculators and the land companies that were, that were investing in this land in order to make it available to the setter, settlers in order to generate profit for themselves. In other words, what if it was the political pressure of land companies and land speculators on the courts that prompted Johnson versus McIntosh? Then, in a sense, couldn't we say that the Constitution is being interpreted in a positive sense, couldn't we say, that the Constitution is being interpreted in order to allow for or to promote the future development of the nation and the opportunities for citizens coming in to own land and be able to experience the American dream. Jefferson, when he purchased Louisiana, made reference to what he called an empire for freedom, an empire for liberty. Jefferson's belief was that in purchasing Louisiana and expanding the landholding of the nation, he was making it possible for unlimited future generations of Americans the opportunity to become landowners. This made America truly the land of opportunity in a world where the same opportunity wasn't available in other places. It made immigration to the New World, to the United States, first choice among those seeking to leave the old world of no opportunity in order to come to a new world with unlimited opportunity. This becomes the definition of American liberty. I keep hearing former President George Bush talking about liberty and expanding liberty. And I see Jefferson talking about creating an empire for liberty. What we're basically talking about is making the American dream available to more and more people. That's the positive sense. But in a much more cynical interpretation, what if we suggest that that's being overly kind to the Marshall Court to suggest that the long-term public interest of the nation is being served in the Johnson versus McIntosh decision by the incorporation of the doctrine of discovery letting alone, not even considering for the moment, whether in fact the doctrine of discovery ought to even be available, since it didn't even include England when it was first, when it first surfaced in the late 15th century. In a sense, it's almost an example of the court reaching, you know, reaching for you know, for whatever it can get its handle on in order to justify what it wants to do. But the question is, the positive part of it is, what it wants to do for citizens who need the availability of land in order for the American dream to become a reality. That's the upside. But the downside is, what if the opportunity being created is in the short term? And it's the opportunity for investors and land speculators to solicit government support and government decision making in order to support their private investment priorities. 
which is the purchase that purchased this land, divide it up into saleable lots and flip it and turn it over to profit by selling it to immigrants and advertising the availability of this land in Europe and elsewhere in order to solicit an endless flow of immigrants, of people coming to this country, seeking out the availability of land ownership for themselves. Now, you might say, well, there's really no difference. One is short-term, the other is long-term, but one leads logically into the other. And I would suggest that, that indeed that's true. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the short term, you're interpreting the constant, you're interpreting the, the decision of the Marshall Court in a much more self-interested way than you would long term, which would seem to be government acting in the interests of the general welfare. It's a little bit of a stretch to claim that helping out land country, land speculators It's a little bit of a stretch to call that promoting the general welfare. But you can do it, especially if you begin to consider some of the very positive, favorable treatment that government gives corporations in this country. On the 25th of March, which was three days ago, the New York Times wrote an editorial entitled, A is for Avoidance. And it deals with the whole issue of hiding assets overseas in order to dodge taxes. We have, you know, about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes left in our program. So let me kind of, uh, you know, run through this very quickly in order to make the point But while we still have time, because I don't want to have to come back to this tomorrow. It won't, won't make sense unless we go back through the, whole, through the whole thing again. This refers to the issue that many of you probably were aware of last week in the United States Senate in, in its hearings on Apple. And this was the idea that Apple was able to hide billions of dollars overseas in order to avoid taxes. And this editorial in the New York Times is related to that, and it talks about Apple's use of tax havens and other tax avoidance tactics as becoming standard operating procedure for American companies. And I think the information here speaks for itself. Microsoft and Hewlett-Packard were the focus of a similar Senate hearing last September, September 2012, while Google, Amazon, and Starbucks have drawn recent scrutiny in Europe. And, of course, there's General Electric, which achieved a perfect zero in its United States tax bill in 2010. In the year 2010, General Electric paid no taxes. In fact, GE was reputed to have the world's best tax avoidance department until Apple came along with tactics to stash $100 billion in Ireland without paying taxes on much of it anywhere in the world and apparently without breaking any law to do it. And that's the problem. Rampant corporate tax avoidance may not be illegal, but does that make it right or fair? And this paragraph is revealing. As corporate tax revenue has withered as a share of the economy and as a share of total revenue, Washington has leaned more heavily on individuals to pay for government. In 2012, last year, personal income taxes and payroll taxes raised $1.9 trillion dollars compared with $242 billion raised from corporate taxes, a disparity that contributes to widening inequality and in turn to a slow economy and less social mobility. Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation estimates 
that fully taxing the profits sheltered abroad by American corporations would raise an additional $42 billion in revenue this year, enough to end more than half of the spending cuts under the recent sequestration. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, because it's not clear that lawmakers are even thinking about stopping this tax avoidance operation. Instead, says the New York Times, they may further entrench the system by making it even worse. The most immediate issue involves tax repatriation holiday. Let me rephrase that. The most immediate issue involves a tax repatriation holiday. Under this law, American corporations can defer paying tax on their profits as long as the money is held abroad. Apple is one of the nearly two dozen major corporations pushing for this tax holiday, which would permit corporations to bring foreign-held profits back to the United States over the course of the year at a discounted tax rate. In other words, they're willing to bring the profits to the country if the government gives them a tax break on it. Otherwise, they'll leave it over there. A tax holiday in 2005 dropped the rate from 35% to 5.25%, enticing corporations to repatriate $300 billion back into the country in 2005. It was billed as a way to create jobs and boost investment. But it was a total policy failure. The repatriated money was mostly used for dividend payments, share buybacks, which tend to raise executive pay, and severance pay for employees laid off in corporate restructuring. The holiday rewarded aggressive tax avoidance. 77% of the repatriated profits coming from tax haven countries, according to the Government Accounting Office. So when we did this tax holiday idea in 2005, $300 billion came back into the country, but it wasn't used to create jobs or, promote or expand the economy. It was used to pay shareholders and to provide increased bonuses to, to CEOs and to pay off corporate execs who were laid off during corporate restructuring. In other words, the $300 billion stayed within the company that raised it. Works, were Even worse, the tax holiday encouraged American companies to come up with even more ways to shift profits abroad in anticipation of a second tax holiday. Since the last one ended, profits held in foreign countries have skyrocketed according to expert testimony at the tax avoidance hearings in the Senate last year. American corporations currently have an estimated $2 trillion stashed abroad. It was pointed out in my class this morning by seniors that not only is this money sitting overseas and not available to government in this country, but since the jobs that that money creates are located overseas as well, then the government is not even getting the benefit of the taxes that employees here pay since the jobs aren't, be cre aren't being created here. So in a sense, we see government operating for the short-term benefit of corporate interests, not for the long-term benefits of its citizens. It's very hard to justify this kind of a policy as promoting the general welfare when that kind of a policy is forcing more and more jobs overseas and has resulted in a situation where currently the stock market is breaking records every day it currently the Dow Jones currently stands above 15,400 but those profits are not generating any kind of job growth unemployment in this country 
still is well above 7.6%. Long-term unemployment is an epidemic in this country. And what we see is many states are cutting back on unemployment benefits, reducing health care benefits, refusing to participate in Medicaid expansion as part of the Affordable Health Care Act, which goes into effect over the next year. So in a sense, it's very hard to justify promoting the general welfare on the part of government when its policies are tailored so clearly in the, in the short-term interests of corporate interests. I'm wondering whether, in fact, those very same short-term interests were Marshall's priority in 1823 when he drew upon the doctrine of discovery to justify the seizure of Indian lands in upper New York State for the benefit of land companies and land speculators. It's very obvious, you know, I mean, this is a historical fact, that George Washington and, and many of the other founders were heavily invested in land companies. Washington himself was president of the Potomac Company, which invested in Potomac drained land with the idea of, in, of, of speculating long term and generating, obviously, corporate profit. So I have to go back to the issue we raised last week in the Marshall decisions of McCulloch versus Maryland and Dartmouth College versus Woodward about Marshall's clear attention to the issue of corporations in America and the extent to which the creation of corporations was part of government's responsibility to promote the public well, the general interest of the public welfare. Something to think about. We have reached the end of our day. It is uh, two minutes before the top of the hour. We will uh, sign off now and give Bob Kincaid an opportunity to set up for his program this evening. For the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and for the Head On Radio Network, this is Bill O'Brien. Thank you for listening. Be safe. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to doing it again tomorrow. Thank you.